Scoop! 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 Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Let's Debate. My stool's a little bit too low, and today we're going to be talking about whatever have you. I don't want to always do 100% the hardcore stick to a topic debates. So every now and then, I'm gonna throw a free for all at you. Give me the opinions you will and we'll continue from there. That being said, in the pinned comments down below, there's going to be a comment me asking what topic would you like to see for a future? Let's debate. And you can go ahead and leave your suggestions down there if you'd like to see another topic based one based on any topics that you perhaps are intrigued by for the sci-fi fantasy genre. Can't be like cooking. Maybe cooking. I don't know, do you want this to be a cooking channel? I'll make it a cooking channel. Apparently something called mukbangs are a thing on YouTube now. I don't, I don't know what that is, but it scares me. And of course, now I have the scariest microphone holder of all microphone holders, a lightsaber. Oh, I better be careful. I could accidentally get laser in the face. Set up and pay off. Oh my God, do you hear? Do you hear that beat? Do you hear that bop? That's the appeal of campfire right there. Do you see these maps? How they're upgraded? Look at this, use this temperature map. Have you ever seen something that lets you build a temperature map before? I don't think so. Do you know the temperature of Rivendell? I don't. Campfire just rolled out Campfire Blaze. It's currently in an open free beta, meaning you, the user, go check out Campfire, check out all these features in their polished new state, and then guess what? You don't even have to pay for the whole thing anymore. You can figure out which features you like during this open beta and modularly pay for just them. Could you complain? Build a fantasy world through characters, religions, maps, what have you, put it all together and only pay for what you're gonna use. So if you're one of these people who was like, I don't wanna do that one big time payment, skablammy, you can now break it up and just have the service exactly as you want it. Campfire Blaze is like the ultimate bro for me on the channel. They help keep your disheveled goblin fed. So why not check out the tool? Well, it's free to do so in that link right down there. Daniel out. I don't, there's no other way I can sell this to you. It's, that's, it's, I don't know what else to say. I'm done, I'm, I'm walking. Despite their best efforts, Daniel slash the fandom are getting way ahead of themselves with the Watt on Prime hype. Talk of seven to 10 seasons, desire slash recommended changes for books deep into the series are silly at this point. Step one is to nail the first season and first, well, we can't speculate. That's entirely what it is. We're just talking about what we hope. And that's, that's all this is. It's not like we're saying like, they have to do this and it's going to happen. Are, are fans not allowed to talk among themselves about, oh, if things go well, here's what we'd like to see. There is no promise we will get more than that. Yeah, no one said there was. Also, we need to be prepped for sweeping changes for the first novel, not just changes for things way down the line. Okay, well, if now you feel like you're getting ahead of yourself. We need to get prepared for a trailer. We can't talk about the first season until we get the trailer. Like, this is what you're sounding like. People are allowed to have fun. Let them have fun. That's, that's what we're doing. With that said, I hope I'm wrong. You're not right or wrong about anything, because all you're doing is telling people not to speculate. Why would, what the f Yo, I wonder if they're gonna keep like the Ebudar architecture. And How could you bring that up right now? Because I was, I don't know, I was just trying to have a conversation. A You're taking the energy. Like, the energy for season we, one. You, this what, is a limited reason. There's about? not gonna be enough energy now. What? This comment genuinely boils down to, hey, don't have fun because the things you're talking about might not happen. Why? I really want to see more crushes in fantasy or literature in general. Love is not always mutual and people get rejected a lot, or maybe they can't even bring themselves to confess their feelings. The fact that everyone, mostly everyone, there are many books that include this, get a positive response when they love someone bothers me. Uh, it is more often than not, but I'm just gonna kind of shuff this into the kind of storytelling we often see in fantasy, which is wish fulfillment, things along those lines, and an enticing happy romance is a big part of that. Though now with a lot more of the darker stuff, we are getting things that go against this. I'm gonna chalk this into personal preference and or that's often limited by the fact that authors need to tell compelling stories and a fulfilled romance with the, as I said at the beginning of this video, set up and payoff is going to be more enticing for people at large. But I will say, yeah, this is something that's gonna be more realistic. And the start of a general theme to a lot of the questions I ended up picking because it has a great demonstrating point to something I wanna to get to overall for these Let's Debate videos. But let's 
continue through. Any writer can write combat or war. What really makes a great writer is when you can make normal boring scenes like conversations or character tangents interesting. I want to push back right away. Not everybody can write combat in war. I just want to put this out there as someone who is struggling to write combat myself. It's not as easy as you think. Writing okay combat is pretty easy. Writing good, compelling, well-paced, structured, coherent combat that is going to stand out from the crowd, extremely difficult. But I get what you're saying. I, I get what you're getting at. George R. R. Martin and Herbert both wrote books where I find myself looking forward to the scheming, arguing, exposition, and philosophizing. A Song of Ice and Fire or Dune are my favorite book series because of this. I think that is a very large part of their appeal is how well they do this. And there are many other authors who do it really well as well. Uh, I think what you're kind of trying to get to is general advice of like, make sure that even in your scenes where quote unquote, nothing is happening. There's subtext, there's character things, there's world things, there's some, there's still a point, always have a point. And if you have that in mind, like Martin and Herbert always do with everything they ever put down, uh, you will still have compelling scenes. You could have someone in a bathtub reading a book, but if you have underlays to that scene, if you have proper setup for the reader to know there are things meta going on, like Frank Herbert especially does masterfully, then yeah. Sounds weird, but I want more dental hygiene mentioned in books. I don't say that I want realistic historical representation. There's a reason I read fantasy, but please mention somewhere if <laughs> if and how people take care of their teeth. Otherwise, there will always be moments where I start thinking of how well their teeth are and whether or not they brush them or if there is some plant or something to take care of your teeth. It's not as important a thing for me as representation of periods in fantasy, but every now and then it comes up in my thoughts. Also, please forgive me any grammar mistakes. English is not my first language. I love this. I think this is great. And I don't know, I'm going to put a plant so everyone chews in my book now to take care of their teeth. I don't know. This is so great. I, I have no counter, but it's f***ing hilarious. <laughs> Daniel should dress up as a disheveled goblin for all fantasy news in October. That's my hot take. There aren't enough costumes on this channel. I'm doing something special for October. My energy's going into that. I don't have time to put together costumes and everything for fantasy news, but I'm trying to get a project done for Halloween. So look forward to that and... We'll see how it goes. They never talk about their socks and fantasy novels. <laughs> God damn it. This is all leading into the theme I talked about. Like you always hear about breastplates or their crosses, but you never hear about what kind of socks they're rocking. Isn't this a big deal? Like in desert fantasies, are the characters wearing socks or not? Do they have appropriate thermal management going on in the toe region in more wintry settings? I don't know, but I feel like this is a huge oversight. <laughs> So I actually literally got into this exact point in an author interview. I think it was with Mr. Weeks. Yeah. And we talked about like, hey, that's actually a really big part of outdoor survival. I was huge into hiking and camping when I was younger. And you need to bring a lot of changes of socks and make sure they're made of the right material. Wet feet can kill you if you do not properly manage them. It's not a lot of fantasy books, though. And that's unrealistic. And yeah, if you're looking for it, could probably really pull you out because you're going to be like, oh, you're saying they'll go through a swampy area and no one's having any issues? Hmm? Mm -hmm. And I mentioned all of these things to come to this extra point here. I want fantasy to be less realistic. I'm sick of historical accuracy, realism, and literalism dominating the conversation around fantasy stories. As long as a story has a consistent internal logic, it doesn't have to be realistic. Realism can be useful in creating that internal logic, but it's better used as a piece of a puzzle than an end goal. This isn't to say that I'm bothered by a subgenre like Grimdark. I like Grimdark, but I'm sick of how so many fantasy fans regard it as the base standard that everything else must be measured against. I don't know a lot of people that do that, but I still see your point. I've seen people say that Star Wars has poor world building because the planets in the Star Wars universe only have one climate, be despite being inhabitable. For example, Hoth is all ice, Tatooine is all desert, etc. But they're still capable of sustaining life, which in the real world probably wouldn't be the case. However, Star Wars, especially the original trilogy, operates with a kind of fairy tale logic, with the universe's rules are internally simplistic in order to create a sense of... Oh.
It may not be realistic that Tatooine is 100% desert, but it's awe-inspiring to think that a desert can be so huge that it encompasses an entire planet. It also hammers home how harsh Luke's circumstances are and how difficult it is for him to escape them. That's not realistic, but it's powerful storytelling. So a couple things. First, just addressing this on its own because I don't want to dismiss you as an individual and still respond to this. Uh, I agree with you at large. I'm actually more in the camp of this than the people who are advocating for socks, dental hygiene, and crushes that don't lead anywhere. When it comes to specifically Star Wars, I always just in my head filled in my own logic of, uh, these used to be planets like Mars where it is pretty inhabitable one climate, but they added things to make it habitable, but it hasn't been enough to change it so it's not all climate in one dominating way. Like that was the logic I put forth, even though that doesn't really make sense scientifically. It's just what I did. But I purposely picked this one and the other ones here to show people who are writing, who I constantly see nervous, like, will anyone like my ideas of fantasy? Will anyone like my styles, my approach, my vision, my goal? Can you not see that there's people out there for everything? Look, okay, so I'm gonna go on a bit of a rant here, and this is an important rant to have. I see so many fantasy fans who want to write their own things that are completely frozen because they're like, what if I get backlash? What if I get hate? What if I don't get above four stars on Goodreads? I'm probably not gonna get above four stars on Goodreads for my book. I'm well aware of that and that's okay. Like it's all right to not write the next Lord of the Rings. Just be happy you're writing. Just be happy with the idea of putting out what you truly want to. Don't worry about finding an audience. As long as what you write is what you're passionate about and that comes through, the audience will find it. Or if it doesn't, who cares? You've written a book. There are people for everything. There are all tastes, there are all desires. Some people want socks to be talked about. Other people don't mind that entire planets don't make scientific sense. It's all right. And I just wanna take a moment to remind everyone, just. Just write because you love it. Just do that and you'll be happier because of it. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. A compelling backstory is not the same as a compelling character. Sure, it enhances what's already there, but a lot of the time I feel like it's used as a substitute for actual character writing. Same thing goes for the over -psycho psychologicalization of main characters. Just because we can write out everything the character thinks about all the time doesn't mean you should. Letting actions of the character speak for themselves, especially if you know how his slash her slash their mind works can go a long way. And I feel like authors often don't trust their audience enough to let them come to certain conclusions on their own. This is essentially the Erickson argument um, in some ways. And uh, I, I agree with it. Uh, this is something that I'm actually having my mind changed on, but I wanna push back in a little bit and say my personal taste is I like to dig as deep into the character's mind the author will allow me. I want them to feel like the author knew who they were 100,000%. And so I like it when we are just deep. I get the appeal of the other side though. And that's okay. There's allowed to be those preferential differences. And you can say, hey, one's a little bit smarter because it's blah, 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 blah. Or you can say, hey, the other one's better built because it's more realized than the author's. And there's appeals everywhere. Um, but I do really respect this approach as well because I think there's a certain artistry to it uh, that's very distinct. I wish YA trends, dystopia, vampires, etc., cycles carried on into adult so I could see more mature grown up versions of it. They do. There's a vampire adult one right there. Oh, here's a dystopian adult one right there. And there's another vampire one. And there's another dystopian one. Um, maybe there's something in the nuance here I'm not missing, but uh, are you meaning like specific tropes of that? Of those YA ones? I'm not sure. Uh, this one I'm not entirely sure about, but I'd like to see people discuss in the comments because I feel like I'm missing something here. What, what am I missing? What did I get wrong? It had 101 upvotes, so I feel like I really missed something. <laughs> I love when the characters are just sitting around doing absolutely nothing. It makes them humanized you and me to you and me, I believe you were trying to go for there. And I'm a big character reader, so I love when they're just hanging out and I get to see their personalities more. This is something that, it kind of depends on what you're writing, but in, in large scope of things, I agree with you. This is one of those things where it definitely sounds nice to say, but I'm also gonna connect it to the previous comment here and say, saying the characters just hang around doing nothing isn't the proper way to put this in my mind. I'm being a nitpicky asshole, let me be that. I think the proper way to phrase this is having the characters just interact while not pursuing their main goal, but allowing the subtext that's been built up within their relationships to pay off. Because I really doubt you wanna watch your character waking up in the morning, brushing their teeth, combing their hair, not even thinking about the main quest and maybe using their like bedpan. That's not the most interesting thing to follow, but having them just hang out, the relationships that have been established, explored or developed in some way, just having some good payoff with things along those lines, I agree with. But I feel like it's just a little bit of a slippery slope, dangerous field to go into to say like, oh, just hanging out's fine. Because even if my favorite characters 
all time from various series got together and started talking. If there was no substance, there was no greater, okay, what are they talking about? Narratively, it would be kind of boring rather quickly. I think a lot of people are going, no, that'd be great. I, I, I don't I actually don't think you'd like it as much as you think. Because you're probably imagining it with some, oh, real subtleties and things built in and a greater arc and an author who's going to have like set up and pay off within just this conversation. But I wouldn't call that just hanging off. But I wouldn't call that just hanging out. That's character development. That's relationship fleshing out. That's realizing certain things. Like just hanging out to me has a lot of baggage as a label. We need more Green Daniel and Pips in this channel. They get almost no screen time and Daniel Green should bring back some segments like exploring fantasy worlds and battles. Hmm. I don't know who this Green Daniel is. He sounds like he's dead. And Pips was in the last couple videos, so I think I've, I've satisfied this now. Bring back segments like exploring fantasy worlds and battles. Yeah, there's stuff like that coming, I promise. I know I haven't gotten back to some of my roots on the channel in quite some time, but that's just because I'm having a fun time experimenting while well, simultaneously finding a relaxing formula that I can fall back on, like these videos, to ease up the pressure and stress on myself. Uh, I've had a lot of realizations recently about just how hard I was grinding for so many years for this channel, and it's been very good for my mental health to take the foot off the gas and kind of be like, oh, I can work maybe only a little bit, okay, still substantially more than regular nine to five hours, but give myself enough time to have a real life and work on my friendships and relationships and my side projects that are not related to this channel. So it's been very good to do that. And those bigger, harder videos are a little antithetical, though there is a very big, highly requested one in the works now with a collab that I'm so excited about, one of my favorite collabs ever. So, uh, just wait and see. Mistborn Era 2 is more enjoyable than Era 1, since it has this layback attitude. Nothing about killing God, just two good guys beating the bad guys. In the same note, Wax and Wayne are just a lot more fun to read than Vin and Kelsier. I'm not saying they're better, but they are definitely funnier. Okay. So I'm gonna push back in an interesting way. I'm not gonna do the typical thing where I'm just gonna go, oh, it's down to personal preference. I'm gonna take on a more aggressive attitude and um, prove you <laughs> wrong with my facts about your feelings. <laughs> Ah! So the idea that Wax and Wayne are more like relaxed as characters and therefore they're funnier and better is, uh, okay, you can have that preference, whatever, that's fine. But what about the whole party? I would say collectively Era 1 has everything you could get from Wax and Wayne, but distributed among a wider cast of characters who are all the more enjoyable because we have these greater relationship webs that Sanderson did such a good job of fleshing out. And in terms of like, well, the stakes are lower, that way I enjoy it more. Why do you like lower stakes? That's not, that's not like actually human psychology. Humans are more compelled by high stakes. That's just a fact. It's a fact. It's nothing else can be true in any way, shape or form. Why is a nuclear bomb under a table more compelling than like, I don't know, a razor blade? Because it's stakes. Also, because it'd probably be kind of strange, like how you guys not know there's a nuke under the table. It's, it's pretty big. It's, it's, it's a giant nuke that takes up a lot of space. And just saying that Wax and Maine are more fun to read than Vin and Kelsier. Are you... I can't even like make a joke about that. Like that's just such a subjective thing. It's like, I, what do I, what do I even push at? Like Vin's more fun because she puts her head through another person's head and um, that uh, equals giggle times. I don't know what to even say here. <laughs> yeah, I would say, I actually, as somebody who prefers Vin and Kelsey, would agree that Wax and Wayne are more fun. And on that goofy, well, <laughs> note, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this one up. Thank you guys for tuning in for another episode of Let's Debate and letting me get on my soapbox for a minute there and uh, discuss, I don't know, we got into a lot here. I feel like there was just an interesting smorgasbord. And as I said, it's for setup and payoff. I will now just play with this lightsaber. Oh no, what happens if I flip this switch? Oh, damn it. <laughs>